Chapter Two of the Majesty of Calmness. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore. The Majesty of Calmness by William George Jordan. Chapter Two. Hurry, the scourge of America. The first sermon in the world was preached at the creation. It was a divine protest against hurry. It was a divine object lesson of perfect law, perfect plan, perfect order, perfect method. Six days of work carefully planned, scheduled and completed, were followed by rest. Whether we accept the story as literal or as figurative, as the account of successive days or of ages comprising millions of years, matters little if we but learn the lesson. Nature is very un-American. Nature never hurries. Every phase of her working shows plan, calmness, reliability, and the absence of hurry. Hurry always implies lack of definite method, confusion, impatience of slow growth. The Tower of Babel, the world's first skyscraper, was a failure because of hurry. The workers mistook their arrogant ambition for inspiration. They had too many builders and no architect. They thought to make up the lack of a head by superfluity of hands. This is a characteristic of hurry. It seeks ever to make energy a substitute for a clearly defined plan. The result is ever as hopeless as trying to transform a hobby horse into a real steed by brisk riding. Hurry is a counterfeit of haste. Haste has an ideal, a distinct aim to be realized by the quickest direct methods. Haste has a single compass upon which it relies for direction and in harmony with which its course is determined. Hurry says, I must move faster. I will get three compasses. I will have them different. I will be guided by all of them. One of them will probably be right. Hurry never realizes that slow, careful foundation work is the quickest in the end. Hurry has ruined more Americans than has any other word in the vocabulary of life. It is the scourge of America and is both a cause and a result of our high-pressure civilization. Hurry adroitly assumes so many masquerades of disguise that its identity is not always recognized. Hurry always pays the highest price for everything, and usually the goods are not delivered. In the race for wealth, men often sacrifice time, energy, health, home, happiness, and honor, everything that money cannot buy, the very things that money can never bring back. Hurry is a phantom of paradoxes. Businessmen and their desire to provide for the future happiness of their family often sacrifice the present happiness of wife and children on the altar of hurry. They forget that their place in the home should be something greater than being merely the man that pays the bills. They expect consideration and thoughtfulness that they are not giving. We hear too much of a wife's duties to a husband and too little of the other side of the question. The wife, they tell us, should meet her husband with a smile and a kiss should tactfully watch his moods and be ever sweetness and sunshine. Why this continual swinging of the censor of devotion to the man of business? Why should a woman have to look up with timid glance at the face of her husband to size up his mood? Has not her day, too, been one of care and responsibility and watchfulness? Has not mother love been working over perplexing problems and worries of home and of the training of the children that wifely love may make her seek to solve in secret? Is man then the weaker sex that he must be pampered and treated as tenderly as a boil trying to keep from contact with the world? In their hurry to attain some ambition, to gratify the dream of life, men often throw honor, truth, and generosity to the winds. Politicians dare to stand by and see a city poisoned with foul water until they see where they come in on a waterworks appropriation. If it be necessary to poison an army, that, too, is but an incident in the hurry for wealth. 
This is the age of the hothouse. The element of natural growth is pushed to one side, and the hothouse and the force pump are substituted. Nature looks on tolerantly as she says, So far you may go, but no farther, my foolish children. The educational system of today is a monumental institution dedicated to hurry. The children are forced to go through a series of studies that sweep the circle of all human wisdom. They are given everything that the ambitious ignorance of the age can force into their minds. They are taught everything but the essentials, how to use their sense and how to think. Their minds become congested by a great mass of undigested facts, and still the cruel, barbarous forcing goes on. You watch it until it seems you cannot stand it a moment longer, and you instinctively put out your hand and say, Stop! This modern slaughter of the innocents must not go on. Education smiles suavely, waves her hand complacently towards her thousands of knowledge prisons over the country, and says, who are you that dare speak a word against our sacred school system? Education is in a hurry, because she falls in fifteen years to do what half the time should accomplish by better methods. She should not be too boastful. Incompetence is not always a reason for pride, and they hurry the children into a hundred textbooks, then into ill health, then into the college, then into a diploma, then into life, with a dazed mind untrained and unfitted for the real duties of living. Hurry is the death blow to calmness, to dignity, to poise. The old-time courtesy went out when the new-time hurry came in. Hurry is the father of dyspepsia. In the rush of our national life, the bolting of food has become a national vice. The words quick lunches might properly be placed on thousands of headstones in our cemeteries. Man forgets that he is the only animal that dines, the others merely feed. Why does he abrogate his right to dine and go to the end of the line with the mere feeders? His self-respecting stomach rebels and expresses its indignation by indigestion. Then man has to go through life with a little bottle of pepsin tablets in his vest pocket. He is but another victim to this craze for speed. Hurry means the breakdown of the nerves. It is the royal road to nervous prostration. Everything that is great in life is the product of slow growth. The newer and greater and higher and nobler the work. The slower is its growth. The surer is its lasting success. Mushrooms attain their full power in a night. Oaks require decades. A fad lives its life in a few weeks. A philosophy lives through generations and centuries. If you are sure you are right, do not let the voice of the world or of friends or of family swerve you for a moment from your purpose. Accept slow growth if it must be slow, and know the results must come, as you would accept the long lonely hours of the night, with absolute assurance that the heavy leaded moments must bring the morning. Let us as individuals banish the word hurry from our lives. Let us care for nothing so much that we would pay honor and self-respect as the price of hurrying it. Let us cultivate calmness, restfulness, poise, sweetness, doing our best, bearing all things as bravely as we can, living our life undisturbed by the prosperity of the wicked or the malice of the envious. Let us not be impatient, chaffing at delay, fretting over failure, wearying over results, and weakening under opposition. Let us ever turn our face toward the future with confidence and trust, with the calmness of a life in harmony with itself, true to its ideals, and slowly and constantly progressing toward their realization. Let us see that cowardly word hurry in all its most degenerating phases. Let us see that it ever kills truth, loyalty, thoroughness, and let us determine that, day by day, we will seek more and more to substitute for it the calmness and repose of a true life, nobly lived. End of chapter 2 Recording by Andrea Fiore